So you've built this amazing Python web app, and now what? You want to put it online, of course, but that's a whole different skill set. Well, today you're in luck because Matthew Mackay is here to tell us all about deploying Python web applications on episode number 26, recorded Monday, August 17th, 2015. I'm a developer, developer, developer. I'm a developer. In many senses of the word, cause I make these applications, but I also use these verbs to make this music. I construct it line by line, just like when I'm coding another software design. In both cases, it's about design patterns. Anyone can get the job done, it's the execution that matters. I have many interests, sometimes conflict. Welcome to Talk Python to Me, a weekly podcast on Python, the language, the libraries, the ecosystem, and the personalities. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Follow me on Twitter where I'm at mkennedy. Keep up with the show and listen to past episodes at talkpython.fm and follow the show on Twitter via at talkpython. This episode is brought to you by Hired and Optbeat. Thank them for supporting the show on Twitter via at hired underscore HQ and at Optbeat. That's right, Optbeat has joined the show as a periodic sponsor and they have a huge announcement for you later in the episode. I have a little news for you this week. First, import Python the newsletter guys, have created a free job board. So whether you're hiring or looking for work in Python, check out importpython.com slash job board. The past two episodes have been with book authors, as is this one as well. And for each episode, I've given away a book to one lucky listener who's already signed up as a friend of the show. I want to say congratulations to Kristen Wedmark from Sweden, who won Fluent Python, and Keith Ord from Georgia, who picked up Effective Python. Do you want to win a book just like Kristen and Keith? Well, be sure to sign up at talkpython.fm as a friend of the show and you'll be in the running. Now let me introduce Matthew. Matthew Mackay is a Twilio developer evangelist based in San Francisco, California, where he builds open source applications in Python and Swift. Matt spoke at EuroPython on Full Stack Python and PyCon about virtual ints and web app deployments. He created the Underwear Library hosted on PyPI and writes Full Stack Python to help fellow developers learn how to build and deploy their whiskey powered web applications. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Michael. Yeah, I'm really glad you're here. We're going to talk about some awesome deployment stuff uh, based on your new book that you wrote. So before we get into deployments and that sort of thing, let's you know start from the beginning. What's your story? How do you get into programming and Python? Yeah, sure. So I've actually been programming for a long time. I took four years of computer science in high school. I was very fortunate to have uh, extensive computer science classes in high school. And I'm a strong believer that that needs to be expanded uh, throughout the United States. Um, And then through that, I got into computer science in college uh, at James Madison University. And then I did my master's in computer science at Virginia Tech. So I've studied computer science for a long time, got a great foundation, and then became a professional programmer as soon as I graduated from college. So uh, that pretty much led me into the Java world, which was a bit away from uh, where I am now with the Python scene. Was your uh, education in Java? Is that how you ended up down that path in the um, beginning? Yeah. Well, it was uh, a combination of C, C++, and Java. Uh, I think you, you know most people go into C++ and they learn a lot about the underlying data structures and uh, pointers and, and all that stuff. And I just found at the time when I discovered Java that it was it was great to not have to think about a lot of the lower level details. Um, and so for me, I just kind of naturally gravitated towards Java also because that's where all the jobs were going. Um, and so I, I sort of grabbed onto that and um, had enough experience in the different languages that I could kind of switch back and forth when necessary. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so you got a job in Java and somehow you made your way over to Python. Yeah, so the gist is I was doing, uh, I was doing Java development on a, um, actually a, a military project uh, for the Department of Defense and I just realized that we had so many Java developers on our team and I would um, go home at night and I was like, I was still trying to learn more and more about programming. And when I came across Python and I started teaching myself Python, I realized in a couple hours of working on side projects, I felt more productive uh, than an entire day at the office. And I just thought, wow, this is, this is something that I think is really powerful as a, as a language, as an ecosystem. Uh, and I wanted to hang my hat on that. So I, I uh, started getting on projects that were more uh, 
uh, based in Python, or I would, for example, write scripts that were in Python for a Java project. And that was kind of my introduction to that world. Yeah, that's really cool. That's both exciting and somewhat regretful. Like, why didn't you do it earlier is one of the feelings. Like, I personally had coming from, you know, C++, which I spent a lot of time working on and perfecting to just, you know, leave in the dust. Yeah, but it, it makes you it makes you appreciate it, right? I mean, every time you don't have to handle pointers or you have a built-in data structure, a dictionary, or a list, like, you really appreciate um, that you don't have to resize that array. You can uh, you can use the built-in data structure, and it's so much more productive. Yeah, absolutely. All that stuff is way more appreciated, at least from my perspective. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So why don't you tell me a little bit about Full Stack Python? Sure. So uh, a few years ago, uh, 2012, I was working on a bunch of different Python projects, consulting projects, and I was working with many junior developers, and they kept asking me questions. They would send me an email, and I would write these long, detailed emails about um, how you know a Whiskey server operates, or what the difference between Django and Flask was. And someone, one of my colleagues, said, "You know, you really should actually publish this. Like, you should put it out there at least just on a website where other people can read it." And that was pretty much the start of Full Stack Python. I took a Christmas break where I had a week off and I just started writing. And, um, and I pretty much pulled in a lot of what I had from emails to just create, uh, this original site that, um, that I just kind of added to, uh, you know, day by day and it, and it just kept growing. So that was, that was the very origin of the site was, Hey, people might be interested in this information. And lo and behold, uh, I started getting readers. So that was, that was the very beginning of it. So how many uh, articles or topics did you have out of your email before you had to start writing for full stack Python? Yeah. So a lot of it was just around web frameworks um, and especially around deployments because I would uh, deploy a lot of applications uh, to just a you know basic server because many of the, the consulting engagements I was on, they didn't have existing Python projects. So they needed someone who was a quote unquote a uh, full stack developer. I know that's like a much maligned term. A lot of developers don't like the term full stack, but I felt like it actually really did apply and I'm kind of stuck with the name now. And I, I don't know, I, I kind of like it. So, uh, yeah, so I, I basically, that was the original quote unquote full stack was the web frameworks and the, uh, the deployments and the servers and that sort of thing itself. Yeah. That's really awesome. Your book that you wrote, what's the title? So it's the full stack Python guide to deployments. Right. So this is basically taking all of your guidance and stuff around the Python web frameworks and just focusing on the deployment side of the story. So it kind of assumes that you're a competent developer, you've written this web app, and now what, right? Yeah. Uh, so I really recommend this to people. Um, the, the way that this came about was I kept getting uh, emails from people who were reading Full Stack Python. And they're like, hey, this is really great. Love Full Stack Python, but it's super high level. And you link to all these tutorials, but they're all sort of uh, just they're different tutorials, they're mix and match. And it was really hard for someone to just without any knowledge of deployment, just get started um, and figure out without reading 50 different articles, like how to actually do a deployment from start to finish. Um, and some of these things are super, well, I, I wouldn't say they're super basic. Like if you don't know how to do them, I wouldn't feel bad about it. But it's just something like walking through provisioning a virtual private server that can be super confusing the first time you do it. So in the book, I actually walk through like, here's how you provision a server on Linode and actually start it up. Yeah, that makes total sense. You know, I do professional training for developers uh, for part of my job. And I get questions like, how, how can I even host my pyramid web app or, you know, whatever type of web app you've created, like, some people who live and breathe the web world, it's like, well, obviously you create this kind of server or that kind of server. But if you're maybe like a data scientist or you're transitioning or you've been in Q&A and you're starting to become a developer, like those are hard choices. And I think part of the guidance of just, hey, look, choose this type of hosting over that type of hosting alone is actually really valuable. Yeah, and I think you, you completely touched on it. If you're a data scientist or you're a coding bootcamp graduate, or you're just out of undergrad, or maybe an intern, you've never been exposed to these concepts before, because they're not things that are typically taught in computer science program. And often deployments are not touched on in a coding bootcamp. Uh, and so just the fundamentals, just the foundational level of how do you get a server? How do you create public private keys? Um, that's completely unknown. 
And um, that's pretty much how, how uh, I wrote the book was I don't assume that you know any of this stuff and we're going to walk through it step by step. Yeah, that's really cool. I think that's, that's a good, good place to start. You have this picture on deploypython.com. I read at the bottom of the homepage. And it's kind of like a visual architectural based version of a table of contents. Yeah, it's, it's really yeah, awesome. Sure. I, I was I really love that picture. I saw it. So it's got like, like a server and, uh, you know, a virtual machine and all the various moving parts, sort of sketched out in architecture, but also showing the chapters and you kind of make your way through this architectural diagram, right? Yeah, exactly. So I start each chapter with the same diagram. And I highlight uh, there's a specific color for each chapter. So like, for example, I think it's uh, chapter three with the operating systems is like a, a shade of yellow. And so I highlight, here's what we're working on in this chapter. And the idea is you start out with this like kind of high level conceptual idea of roughly what we're working on. Um, and maybe that's on your own server or that's a hosted service like GitHub or something like that. But you at least have an image in your mind of what we're going to be working on. And I think for people that are just starting in this space, it actually can be super confusing. Like, well, okay, I have a Git repository, but is that like local on my computer or is that on GitHub and how do they relate? Um, and where does the, where does the virtual private server sit? So that's what I tried to clarify a bit with the picture that's on um, deploypython.com. It's just, here's all the things we're going to walk through and here's how they look. Yeah. I think it's great to have a, a visual way to see what you're going to learn like that in, architecturally. Yeah, I mean, actually, that came from a lot of this came from uh, a talk I gave at EuroPython in Berlin in 20, 2014 uh, called Full Stack Python, where I pretty much had a picture like this and I walked through conceptually what the full stack of a Python deployment is. And the feedback from people was like, that talk would have been really hard to follow if not for the visuals. So I thought, okay. Obviously, these visuals are powerful, and they sh I should continue on with that. And I've and I've been trying to add even more to them to fullstackpython.com as I go along. Yeah, that's excellent. And I'm sure that talk is actually on YouTube somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah, it totally is. If you do EuroPython, Full Stack Python, uh, my talk comes up. Uh, if you actually, if you do uh, Google for Full Stack Python, Kate Heddleston gave a really great talk as well at um, PyCon, and I believe it was uh, 2014 um, that kind of talks uh, walks through some of the same concepts. Yeah, excellent. I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, so let's talk about servers first. Uh, you're using Linode for your host here, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's kind of, I think maybe it's a little bit uh, confusing in the book because I, I say, well, we're going to deploy this application. And um, actually, I before we like kind of dive into the servers, I, I actually have an appendix where we create an application. I say, like, if you've already got an application, um, great. Like you, let's figure out how to deploy it. You can pretty much follow the steps um, in each chapter and you start out with the server. Um, and if you don't have an application, like here is a full tutorial. It's the it's, uh, Appendix C in the book where I walk through an entire open source application, Flask application that is, um, has all of the pieces that we need. Like it has a task queue. It has, um, has all these application dependencies and whatnot. It's a Flask app. Um, and so the idea is like if you, uh, before we even get started with the server, um, if you've got an application, great. If you don't, hey, you might want to go and read Appendix C if you want to know about this application um, before we deploy it. Yeah, very cool. At minimum, get clone it so you have something to go deploy, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. And I mean, the great part is like I actually wrote uh, that content on the Twilio blog, which um, Twilio is my, my current employer. And so uh, that, that appendix has been... Uh, you know, a lot of people have followed along with that and given me feedback on it. So it's a pretty good tutorial um, just to include as an appendix if you are trying to build a Flask application. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, let's come back to talking about what you do at Twilio because that sounds interesting. But Lin Linode. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the idea behind uh, really how we get started in this is like, okay, we we need to deploy our application somewhere. That can't just be living on your laptop. Like people on the internet need to access that. Uh, and so we... Uh, get a $10 a month server on Linode. And uh, I walk through the steps of like how to actually provision that. Um, and then once we provision it, we uh, boot it up and we create a public private key and we lock down the server against unauthorized um, a, a attempts to log in. So we disallow the root user from being a login account. We create a separate login account. Uh, we disable password authentication. We only have public key infrastructure uh uh, authentication and we set up firewalls and automatic upgrades and these things will not 
completely secure a server, but they're the good first steps that I would always recommend people do to every single server that they are they're starting up. You know, one thing that my current experience absolutely backs this up, but just sort of the way the cloud and and sort of this type of hosting has been going, you know, I was a little surprised you weren't using like uh, Ubuntu machines on EC2. Yeah, sure. So I think, um, you know, I, I really like Amazon Web Services, but I also feel like it's almost overused for a lot of deployments. Like you can actually take a virtual private server and scale that up to hacker news traffic um, if you configure it properly. And I think that's one of those things where like you can rack up a huge bill deploying to Amazon Web Services uh, if you're not careful. Whereas like the idea behind this was like, let's learn all the pieces that you need in order to actually deploy a Python application. And um, we're going to do that within the confines of a single virtual private server. Um, it's a much more controlled environment for the audience of the book, which is really people who are unfamiliar with deployments. But I, I totally think you're right. And there could be an entire separate book that's like, okay, cool. You've learned the, the gist of deploying web applications. Uh, now let's actually go and deploy this on a, a cloud-based infrastructure. Uh, or, or I guess you'd call it like an um, uh, infrastructure as a service provider like Rackspace or Amazon or Azure. Right. Yeah, for sure. So I think probably the majority of people out there would be better served by using something like Linode or DigitalOcean. The pricing is so straightforward and the setup is so easy and so quick. And EC2 is is more, you know, it, it's something that works for places like Netflix, which are doing amazing things, but it's like so large scale. And when you're getting started, you know, it seems like it used to be the place to start, but maybe it's not not the good starting point. Maybe it's a place to grow into. Yeah, I think I think it might be something to grow into. I, I just, I really wanted to try to cut down the complexity so that everyone felt like they could follow along in the book. And I think that um, that if you if you understand the concepts in this book, you can probably also move on and pick up um, the Amazon Web Services side to it. But it, it, you're totally right in that it's confusing on some of the pricing. And I also have heard a lot of horror stories from new developers that said like, oh, I accidentally spun up like 20 servers and I got a bill for $1,000 this month. And I'm like, oh, no, like, <laughs> I really, really don't want that to happen to people and have them be afraid of doing deployments. Like, uh, if you get a, a bill for $10 a month, that should be the maximum amount that you get out of this. Right. It's much more predictable over in those places. Yeah, uh, very cool. Exactly. So when you're talking about locking down the servers, one thing that I thought was pretty cool that you recommend is using something called fail to ban. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so fail to ban um, uh, is uh, essentially just a package on Ubuntu. Um, I believe it, it's uh, on many of the other distributions as well, which uh, essentially sets certain parameters like uh, time-based failed logins. So if uh, from a certain IP address, uh, there are failed login attempts, it will uh, prevent any any uh logins from that IP address for, for example, like the next 30 minutes. So the idea would be it provides just enough, like just enough um, of a prevention that uh, someone who is trying to log into that server. Now, granted, they can't do a password based login anyway, um, after it's secured down, but it's just one other step of um, basically the, the, the just locking down the server that will prevent some of those unauthorized attempts. Right. And while you're going through this process, you know, your machine, if it is on the internet, it is basically under attack, right? Yeah. And so having yeah. it sort of password login safe for a while is still something you want to consider. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I think part of it too is just exposing uh, readers to some of these some of these tools and concepts that they have at their disposals. I, I think that you could write, and I'm sure there are entire books written about fail to ban or about um, UFW, which is the firewall tool that we use. Um, but just knowing that they're there and that you've set them the basic parameters up, I think is enough to get people started, um, but not dwell on those subjects so that they can continue on and actually get the deployment done. Right. Yeah. The other thing that I made a note of in this chapter when I was reading your book is UFW or uncomplicated firewall. That thing is yeah. so easy to set up and it's great. <laughs> oh, I mean, I was, I actually wrote a whole section on like setting up IP tables. Uh, and then when I started doing some research, I realized in Ubuntu, there is this U uncomplicated firewall. And I was like, oh, wow, this does everything that I was trying to show off in, uh, in IP tables. Uh, it's so much easier. I think it'll just simplify the deployment process. So that's that's pretty much what I went with. Yeah, absolutely. I would say it's even uncomplicated. It's great. 
Yeah. <laughs> so then basically for the rest of the book, you said, look, you could sit down and manually type these out at the command line, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, let's make this reproducible. And so the next thing you bring up is actually Ansible and playbooks, right? Yeah. So, um, well, there's, there's fabric and there's Ansible. Um, and so the idea is, I think that going through and manually doing deployment and reading through what steps you're taking is really important for the learning process. Uh, but obviously you're not going to do this every time you have a deployment. So you're going to want to automate the entire process so that you can uh, deploy as many web applications in the future as you want. And you can modify the deployment scripts so that they're custom built for your applications. And so every single chapter in the book, uh, so starting with chapter two, which is the server chapter, we do the manual steps and I explain manual, like what you're doing in those manual steps. And then I go into a, a sort of second sec section of the chapter, which is here's how we man, uh, here's how we automate the manual steps that we just did, uh, with either fabric or, uh, Ansible. And so starting in chapter three, we have Ansible playbooks that automate everything that we're building on top of. And actually those, all of those, um, that, that playbook, that Ansible playbook is actually all open source on GitHub, um, under, uh, one of the GitHub repos that I have. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. We'll put that out there on the show notes as well. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I think you're right. You know, it's, this is one of the things where if you've got time and you haven't deployed your, you haven't you know, made your, your site live or whatever, it's fine to just sit there and, fiddle with a server until you get it working. But if something goes wrong, especially, you know, you need to rebuild the machine or move it or, or scale it out or something. And you have got to do that under some high stress situation. Like the website is down, there's lots of traffic doing that by hand, you know, is just extremely stressful. And if it's automated, you push a button a few minutes later, the life, you know, life is good again. It's definitely recommended. Um, This episode is brought to you by Hired. Hired is a two-sided, curated marketplace that connects the world's knowledge workers to the best opportunities. Each offer you receive has salary and equity presented right up front, and you can view the offers to accept or reject them before you even talk to the company. Typically, candidates receive five or more offers in just the first week, and there are no obligations, ever. Sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? Well, did I mention there's a signing bonus? Everyone who accepts a job from Hired gets a $2,000 signing bonus. And as Talk Python listeners, it gets way sweeter. Use the link hired.com slash talk python to me, and Hired will double the signing bonus to $4,000. Opportunities knocking. Visit hired.com slash talk python to me and answer the call. I, you know, I honestly, it, uh, I've been using it for, for several years. Um, I think it's a fairly stable, um, uh, default choice. Um, uh, but I think there's a ton of other great whiskey servers out there. Um, and certainly if you're going the Apache route, mod, mod whiskey is, is a good route to go. Um, but it just, in this case, I thought the, the combination of green unicorn and, and, um, uh, and Nginx just seemed to be the one that I was most comfortable with and the most comfortable teaching other people about. Right. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. The one that I've been using is micro whiskey. So that's, that's also been pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've read some, I've seen some of the, you know, you have to be careful about the benchmarks and stuff, but I've read some benchmarks that have said that that actually might be a, a faster whiskey server, um, in, in many cases. Right. So, you know, going with the theme that not everybody is a web developer necessarily knows, maybe you want to just talk really quickly about what whiskey, the concept of whiskey itself yeah, sure. So, uh, so that's web server gateway interface, WSGI. And the idea is like in the late nineties, um, there was a something. So Apache was the dominant web server back in the day. And someone wrote a, uh, a, mo a module for Apache called mod Python. And I used mod Python for a while. It was pretty much just a execute arbitrary Python code. And, um, that worked really well for a while. There were some security vulnerabilities, uh, discovered in it and development on it kind of languished. So the Python community came together and created, um, a Python enhancement proposal of PEP, uh, PEP 333, which created the WSGI uh, standard. 
And uh, then there's a, a superseding one, which is PEP 3333. <laughs> That's four threes. And that one just really was a simple update to say, like, we're, um, we're expanding this to include Python 3. But the idea behind it is, uh, and, and, and I have a kind of have a, a, a ba- some more background knowledge on this with the application dependencies page on, um, on full stack Python. But uh, the idea was like, there needs to be a standard, super simple way for a web, ser- uh, a web application server, uh, like, you know, cherry pie or mod whiskey or, um, uh, green unicorn to execute, uh, a web application. Uh, and so if you're using Django flask, or bottle one of these frameworks, they implement the application side of the whiskey standard, whereas your whiskey server implements the server side. And so there's a simple hook between um, the server and the application in order to get that uh, up and running um, so that you can deploy this in a standard way and you can mix and match different frameworks and servers that provides the interoperability uh, between uh, the whiskey servers and the whiskey applications. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. I mean, it basically means that we could switch between micro whiskey and green unicorn and it wouldn't be yeah. that big of a deal. Right. Yeah, exactly. So if you're more comfortable with a different whiskey server, you know, by all means you could use the exact same setup, but switch out the whiskey server and, um, and use the one you're most comfortable with. So we've got our app running. We've got our reverse proxy from Nginx over to green unicorn. Everything seems to be good, but now you want to start pushing changes to your production servers and you want to make sure that stuff is not broken before you do that. So that brings us to continuous integration. Yeah, sure. Um, and the, uh, the only other quick thing I wanted to add was we do add a task queue as well in there. Um, task queues are for asynchronous data processing outside the HTTP request response cycle. So the idea here is like, that's such a common thing that people want to deploy. I just added celery as a part of our application deployment, um, just so that people would be comfortable with adding that. I feel like that's something that is often left out of deployment tutorials that I thought really needs to be included in the book. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, you know, some some variation of an asynchronous queue can add so much scalability to your app yeah. in a really easy way, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, this, this um, you know, this database query is taking too long uh, when someone hits the server. Well, just put it in an async task, task queue and, and process it, you know, every 15 minutes or something like that if the data doesn't change that often. Um, and that way you're getting... Um, pretty much scalability by the design of your application and the deployment rather than, uh, you know, having to get a bigger, beefier server in order to somehow process that app, that database query even faster. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Continuous integration. Yeah. So the idea here is, um, again, uh, many of the tutorials that I saw, like continuous integration was like this completely separate setup from doing a deployment. And so I thought, well, you know, this is really core to how applications are deployed. Um, so we take the Ansible configurations, uh, I'm sorry, the Ansible playbooks that we've created throughout the book. And we set up Jenkins as the implementation of a continuous integration server. We do it on a separate virtual private server. So technically, um, if you do the whole setup, it's $20 a month because you have two separate servers. Um, but then we set up the whole configuration where when you push changes from your local development environment to GitHub, uh, it has a service hook uh, or what's really a, a standardly called or uh, most commonly called a webhook. Um, webhook notifies Jenkins that, hey, there's been some changes. So Jenkins pulls down the code, uh, make sure that everything is uh, working. And this is the part where you could put in your hook for like unit tests and integration tests um, and fail the build if those don't work. Uh, and then if everything is good, we deploy the, the code to the, um, the, the actual server, the production server. And uh, then you get uh, a handy little text message that says your application deployment is complete. So oftentimes we have these really long running deployments. Maybe they take 10 or 15 minutes to you know, pull all the code and do the whole deployment and everything. Um, so maybe you want to step away from your from your uh, server. Or, I'm sorry, your um, your computer. Go uh, you know, go ha- go grab a, a coffee or a beer or something like that. But then when it's all done, then you get a text message to your phone and it says, "Hey, this is uh, this is all complete." Very cool. And of course, uh, Twilio is the back end for the text message, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really love uh, using Ansible. And um, so I just was kind of playing around with um, some of the modules and stuff like that. So, so the Twilio module is like in, um, it's, it's a part of the standard uh, Ansible. Uh, if you do like a pip install Ansible, 
Um, so you can just do uh, use the use Twilio service with your credentials to send a text message. Um, so I actually wrote that uh, like a year, year and a half ago. Yeah, that, that's really cool. Yeah, it's kind of under the notifications package. Um, you could also do like, for example, I don't do this in the book, but you could do like an email or something like that uh, when the deployment's done. So there's all different types of notifications. Um, you can do a notification to Slack. Super easy to add that in instead of the Twilio notification. But um, I'm kind of partial to getting a text message because I like to walk away from my computer when the deployment is working for me. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Let something else stick around and, and be tied to the, the desk. So one thing I did want to do is I want to give a shout out to one of my sponsors, CodeChip, because, you know, Jenkins is is a cool Java app you install and you sort of configure yourself. And CodeChip is kind of, you know, CI as a service. So check them out if if you're not wanting to set up something. Yeah, no doubt. I've had some bunch of friends who've had good good experiences with CodeChip. So. Yeah, awesome. So that, that was kind of the end of the book in its current form. And you had some, hey, you might want to consider these other things sort of right at, at the end there. And so you had one section on deployment enhancements, which we've talked about a few, we've sort of touched on them and others on performance. So one of the first one you said was sort of having a QA environment. Yeah. <laughs> that might be uh, a good idea. So, yeah. So, you know, I, I glaze over this maybe a little bit um, and, and maybe it deserves, uh, you know, a lot more, um, a lot more thought and maybe a future version. But the idea here is like in, in the majority of companies, you have a test environment where uh, someone can go in and make sure that the latest uh, features that you, that you, the developers have built um, are working or that it just uh, runs, for example, like Selenium tests or something like that. Now you could do that on the continuous integration server, but the idea here is like, instead of deploying to your production environment, which if it's not, uh, you know, you don't have a good code coverage or uh, wide enough code coverage could actually break the deployment. You deploy to a server where you take a look at everything and you say, okay, this is good. Let's go ahead, push the button and, and hit this, uh, put this into production. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, a possibility. Uh, certainly that's a very standard um, setup for, you know, having test servers. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a good idea. If it's a big problem when you push out a bad build Yeah, related to that is uh, having the ability to roll back a deployment. Yeah. I mean, so most deployments now, a mature deployment is going to have some way where if it's, if it turns out, um, cause a lot of times you have production data that is different from your test data, especially if that's, you know, personally identifiable information. So that would many times as I did some government consulting, uh, or maybe have HIPAA compliance in the healthcare industry, something like that. Um, I certainly don't, I certainly recommend that if you, you don't just read this book and do your HIPAA compliant deployment or something like that. I think this is really a, a learning book. Um, but the idea here, uh, behind, behind code rollbacks would be, um, the deployment doesn't, uh, goes wrong, goes bad. Um, it's going 502 HTTP errors, uh, maybe the whiskey servers having some issues. Uh, and so the idea is like you just roll back to the previous version without having um, to manually log into the application and all that stuff. What, uh, what are the moving parts you had in mind for that? Um, so, so part of it is just going, you could go back to a different, um, get tag. So what often happens every time you do a build on Jenkins, you, you actually tag the code. Uh, so you could, you could do that, um, in that case, and then you would go back to a previous tag, which points to a previous commit. Um, the, the complication there really comes in with the database, uh, schema. So if you've migrated the database schema, you also need to add in a hook where you can, uh, roll back the migration. So there's a bunch of different steps that are involved in there. Um, and this kind of brings up the larger point, which is like, I added this chapter because I wanted to know from readers, what would they find most useful? Like, what are the problems that they're encountering? Because I think these are all very valid things, but um, maybe some of them are more important to readers than others. Yeah, definitely. One other one in that area that I thought was interesting was deploying through a system package instead of version control. Yeah. So, in this case, you could install um, you could install your application by uh, bundling it in like a you know Debian package or some some people use uh, Red Hat um, and so Red Hat has RPMs. Um, the idea here is like you're not using source control in order to do your deployment, and there are many advantages to doing that. But that's I would I would argue that's a little bit more of an advanced deployment topic and something that uh, has 
more complexity than I wanted to introduce the reader to at this point uh, in the book. I was really trying to make sure that this was a learning process that didn't lose people along the way. Right, absolutely. It it is a cool idea, you know. In show twenty three with uh, Eli Ribble and Authentize, those guys were using pip for all their deployments, which, along with Git tags, was really an interesting uh, way of doing it. Basically, they'd pip install their app, and it would suck down all of their internal libraries to a private PyPI server. This episode is brought to you by Opbeat. Opbeat is application monitoring for developers. It's performance monitoring, error logging, release tracking, and workflow in one simple product. Opbeat is integrated with your code base and makes monitoring and debugging of your applications much faster and your code better. Opbeat is free for an unlimited number of users and until now has only been available for Django developers. But I can announce that they are launching Flask support today to all you Talk Python listeners. Visit opbeat.com slash flask to be among the first to join the Flask private beta. Yeah, that's totally, totally a legitimate way to do it. And, and in many environments, like the security folks are going to say, hey, you actually cannot install from, from public PyPI or something like that because they're worried about um, breaches that could, could occur through those things. I think the main thing is just that every company has to decide what's going to work for them so they can get stuff done and reevaluate that on an ongoing basis. Because what I often see with deployments as I go, as I used to go into consulting clients was they decided 10 years ago how they were going to deploy their applications and never reevaluated that. And that's where you really encounter some, some pains um, because they're you know not up to date with the latest practices and whatnot. Yeah. There's some pretty egregious stuff out there that people just yeah. stick with because, well, that's how we've been doing it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what your book is meant to be solving, isn't it? To, to some degree. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that this is all going to continue to evolve. I wouldn't say that, you know, this is, you know, the definitive way that everyone should do their deployments. But I really do think that if you've never touched a deployment before, like this is, uh, I, I I feel pretty good that this is going to be a great resource for, for people that are in that situation. They'll learn a ton from it. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing that I suspect you thought of, but is not necessarily in the book, and this is not a criticism, I agree with it, is containers or R containers and Docker. Yeah, totally. Well, my hope is, is that I can actually get uh, one of my um, one of my good friends, um, Andrew Baker, who was one of the reviewers of the book to write a chapter on Docker. He, um, he actually did the O'Reilly video for Docker, uh, sort of introduction to Docker and knows a ton in that area. So I am not as familiar with containers as, um, so far has not been something that, uh, I've spent a lot of time with. Um, so I didn't want to lead the reader in the wrong direction, but I certainly think that that is, um, a possibility for, for doing deployments and may simplify the process a lot. Yeah, I think it would. I mean, it doesn't, negate all the knowledge in your book you still need to know how to set up green unicorn you still need to know how to set up nginx it just happens to be you might do that in a container right sure but yeah. still the knowledge is is it's totally builds on what you did so that makes a lot of sense and the last thing that you talked about were sort of performance improvements right so you mm -hmm. talked about putting this all on one machine no load balancing uh, right. like at a $10 server and then you know that's good for like six months until the traffic spikes and then then what right yeah, I mean, it totally depends on your application. I mean, if you, um, you know, if you're doing everything with Redis on the back end, um, then you could actually scale this to like a very large number of requests per second. Um, but there are, uh, very clear ways in which you can offload processing, uh, and for example, serving static assets from a content delivery network. That is a super easy win if you have a bunch of images in your application. And instead of serving it from your Nginx server, you're going to be serving them up from Akamai or, you know, uh, Amazon CloudFront, something like that. Um, you could also have multiple web servers that are connected to a single database backend and have load balancers uh, between them. Um, that, again, all of these things add some complexity um, some more than others to the deployment process and are totally valid ways to improve performance. 
Um, but it's going to depend on your application. And I think that's where more of the nuance, like going from after reading this book, you're kind of a beginner deploy, de uh, beginner knowledge level and deployment, um, to go to the intermediate level, you really have to look at your specific application and say, okay, where are the bottlenecks? And that's where you change your deployment process to match. Right. It doesn't make sense to just go, I'm going to scale the heck out of this thing. And yeah. when <laughs> you're adding complexity that you might not need to be adding, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah the, the other, um, thing we could swap in here instead of improving performance is maybe improving durability because a lot of the horizontal scale will also get you that right if a, a machine fails you could take it out of the load balancer or you got to reboot one something like that right yeah i mean that's yeah you could absolutely have like a database replication server where um, that's a read-only server so maybe you read from the read-only server and you have a write-only database server um, there's all sorts of ways you can improve the durability here um uh, you know, if you, if that's you know, top of mind for your application. So you want to talk a little bit about what you got going on at uh, Twilio before we wrap things up? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first, what, what is Twilio? Sure. So, um, so Twilio, Tw Twilio is a, um, it's a cloud communications platform, which um, might sound a little bit buzzwordy if you're a developer. Um, but really the idea is we provide a web API um, that I like to think of as an abstraction layer upon the telecommunications industry. Um, but more broadly than that, as we expand out, so we started out with voice calling. Um, we later added uh, a few years later, SMS. Um, we've added uh, multimedia message. So it's like text messaging, uh, but also, you know, uh, uh, sound clips, uh, movie uh, clips, pictures via text message um, through a standard MMS uh, protocol um, over domestic carriers in the United States and, and Canada. Um, and then now we've expanded, we have a beta product for video, which is just pretty much the coolest thing that I have ever played with. Uh, building a video application uh, over, uh, it's it's abstracted over uh, WebRTC, but we expose all the, all the underlying things, but you can build a video application in like five minutes. And it's like my favorite thing to play with lately. Uh, but we also do, we also have a beta product for IP messaging. Um, we've introduced a lot of these things lately. And the idea is if you, you are a developer and you are adding some type of communications to your, to your application, whether that's a mobile or web application, then, um, you should think about using and, and take a look at Twilio. Um, and that kind of gets into what I do for Twilio, which is, um, my title is developer evangelist. Um, some companies call that like a developer advocate or developer relations, um, the idea is like all of my work for the most part is open source. So I'm helping uh, the community be able to implement, not, not only implement Twilio uh, in their applications, but also just uh, being active and involved in the communities that I, I uh, most enjoy being a part of. And obviously first and foremost, that's the Python community. It's been my community for, for years now. I have so many great friends in the Python community. Um, I'm really, really proud of just the direction that the community is going in. I think we've got some incredible leaders um, putting us in the right direction for things like PyCon and um, just the general community. Yeah, and I think that growth and positive energy is accelerating, if anything. So very, yeah. it's a very, it's a very great time to be part of it. Yeah. So you know, that's kind of my primary community. I've also been doing a bunch of Swift development. Um, I like iOS. I just bought the Apple Watch, which is pretty cool. So I'm starting to you know, dabble in that area. Uh, but really like those are my, my core communities. And, um, so like I, last night I was at a Swift meetup tonight, I'll be at San Francisco Python. Um, uh, but the idea is like as a developer vandals, I'm out in the community and I'm really just helping my fellow developers. Like I would be doing that anyway. Um, the great part is if they are building an application and they want to know how to send a text message or they want to add two factor authentication or they want to add voice calling or video in the future, like I can help them do that and I can help them really quickly. And hopefully, um, they've already met me or they've met one of my colleagues and therefore um, it's super easy to shoot me an email or call me up on the phone and I can help them out and they can start um, using Twilio. Yeah, that's awesome. It's great to have you as a resource for that. So obviously Twilio is all about having Python developers, you know, pip install your guys' APIs and, and work with them. Are you using it internally or are you using Python internally? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's a project called Flask RESTful which is uh, pretty common for creating uh, RESTful APIs with Flask. 
Um, so that actually is what runs our um, web API itself, like the endpoints themselves. So we actually open source that project. Um, it's now in its own separate uh, organization on GitHub. Um, but that was created by some folks at, at Twilio. And so we, we open source that for the community. Um, so we do use quite a bit of Python internally. Um, we also use uh, JVM languages like Scala and Java. Um, we still some, have some PHP on the back end, which um, some people are a little bit, you know, skittish to admit, but uh, PHP is still a totally valid language. Um, and then, you know, we have some iOS and Android developers who work on, on some of our mobile stuff. So we've got, we have a, a, a lot of languages in the mix at Twilio. What does the deployment look like for your API front ends relative to your book? Sure. Yeah. So uh, really the big difference and kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is we actually are completely deployed on Amazon Web Services. And so we have, uh, for the most part, an immutable architecture, which means that once you spin up a server on Amazon Web Services, you don't modify that server in flight. We spin up new servers with new configurations and backfill and spin down the servers that are old. Um, so we don't have people going in and modifying uh, servers that are already operational. Um, that helps with complexity. Uh, it also helps that, uh, you know, when you have thousands or however many servers we have out there on Amazon Web Services now, you cannot go and manually configure those services. So uh, certainly many of the uh, principles that are taught in this book, um, like especially around web server configuration, are completely valid uh, for how we run our operations. Um, but they're at a very, very large scale um, considering the number of, of API calls that we we have um, in every single hour of every single day. Yeah, that's really awesome. I think, you know, that's the right use case for EC2, right? When you get to that scale and you need that much fine-grained programmability to the API to actually create and provision machines and all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, but it means that also that, like, the knowledge you learn from doing deployments here is completely valid for doing deployments in a much larger environment. It's just that uh, those tend to be, uh, those the deployments that we do at Twilio are, uh, you know, they've been honed and enhanced and um, and in some ways, you know, in increased in complexity over the past seven years, the, the life cycle of the company. So, you know, those, these things don't suddenly get created overnight. Um, no, you grow into yeah. those sorts of things. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know if you listened to the Netflix episode, but they talked about what they're doing in EC2 there. And they have so many different configurations and so on that they've actually set up scikit-learn and machine learning to understand if there's a deployment problem. That, I mean, it's amazing. I have a really great friend at Netflix, um, and he uh, actually spoke at uh, Twilio's Signal Conference um, this past year. And uh, he, he talked a lot about all the tools at their disposal. I think what they do where they open source a lot of their tools is absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, they use a just a huge number of uh, uh, AMIs, which are like the Amazon machine images, uh, in order to pretty much just snapshot uh, what they want to deploy. Um, so they're like sort of, they were one of, I think, probably one of the first to really take advantage of the, the free AMI snapshots. And now they're um, you know using that at scale and obviously using machine learning and uh, they're on the forefront of all this stuff. It's it's amazing what they're what they're working on. Yeah, if if your book introduces people to the beginning steps, that's the opposite end of the spectrum, isn't it? Yeah, sure. And I mean, I think I, my hope is is that uh, if you read this book and you're really excited about this deployment, these deployment concepts, because deployments used to be like a system administrator going in and punching a bunch of keys and, you know, manually installing things like, yes, you should understand some of that stuff. So you can get like a foundational layer for doing deployments and, and setting up servers, but really uh, deploying at scale is programming. Like when you are automating a deployment, you are programming in the same way as you building an application. And so um, what Netflix and, and what we're doing at Twilio, a huge part of the deployment process is just programming the deployment process and, and automating everything that's out there. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing that look inside Twilio. That's cool. Two questions before I let you out of here. Sure. Uh, what's your favorite editor? If you're going to write some Python code, what do you open up? I use Vim for pretty much everything. Um, I use Xcode for writing Swift um, just because that's like the default uh, that you go to, but I've been using them for a long time and um, 
that is my my go to. My uh, Vim, as you probably can tell, but if you ever go to the Vim page on Full Stack Python, it's a uh, a lot more uh, meaningful information than the Emacs page, which was uh, <laughs> community contributed because I. Uh, I don't know if I've ever actually opened up Emacs before. <laughs> nothing, nothing against it. I just, I stuck with them for a long time. Yeah, that's funny. And I can imagine you wouldn't want to do storyboards in iOS. <laughs> <laughs> no, I uh, don't, I don't want to figure out how to, how to write, uh, you know, iOS applications in them. I don't know. Yeah, that definitely <laughs> requires an ID. All right. Other <laughs> one is your favorite PyPI package that maybe people don't know about or you want to raise the awareness of. Okay. So I'll, I'll go with two of them. Um, one is like a little bit more self-promoting. My favorite one that I wrote is called underwear. And the idea behind underwear was I wrote this project over like five or six weeks. And it's like, I thought, why don't we have when you're working in Django, like a Python manage.py deploy, like, and that just deploys your entire application to a, like a virtual private server. And what it does is it uses Ansible programmatically under the covers, um, to handle the entire deployment for you. Uh, so if you use like pip install underwear and you add it to your installed packages, you suddenly get new manage.py commands. Uh, and one of them is deploy and you just point it at a server and boom, your application's like up and running. I haven't worked on it all that much lately, uh, but it's kind of magical when you get the configuration right. And you're just like, uh, wow, I just deployed through the Python manage.py, um, commands so underwear is that one it's all open source under mit license that's really cool and th the fact that you got that name for it is is awesome uh yeah well i mean the meaning behind the name was basically like uh this is how you could start doing your deployments um if you want to and then you can change your deployment process later uh, and no one will know it's like changing your underwear and like no one sees your underwear so like they don't really care how that goes so i don't know that was the gist behind it that's and funny i thought and it was and it was actually it, it's really funny when people are like oh uh like i i was at django con one time and someone was like oh you're the underwear guy and my colleague was like i'm sorry like what what did that person just say and i was like oh i wrote the underwear package like <laughs> that's what they mean i'm not an underwear model or something like that <laughs> Um, so that, um, but other than that, I mean, um, you know, it's, I actually really like the, um, uh, especially when I was doing consulting, I mean, saving time through, uh, like the, uh, uh, Excel, the Excel, like read and write packages. Um, and so it's been a little while since I've used them in the past, but like, if you need to read from or write to Excel spreadsheets, which, uh, is shockingly the system of choice for the vast majority of corporate America. Um, like if you were trying to create a web application that automates what is happening in an Excel spreadsheet, like these packages, um, so it's like Excel RD, uh, and Excel W, I believe, something like that. Um, these packages on PyPI are like the, so much time savers. Like I just, I don't know. Every time I've used them, I've been like, thank goodness. Like if I had to, create this all from scratch myself, I never would have gotten this project done. I think you're right about how much of corporate America and enterprise space runs on, on Excel. It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, companies have entire names for like one company I work for called them uh, EUCs and they kept throwing around the EUCs acronym. And I'm like, finally, I'm like, what is an EUC? And they're like, end user computing basically means the end user created the computing system on which they are, you know, doing all their processing on, which is uh, Excel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much what it means. <laughs> those are those are some uh, good ones to know about. Thanks, Matt. This has been super interesting, and I think for those listeners out there who are not day to day doing deployments, this is a really helpful book. Do you want to just tell people how they can get your book and? things like that? Yeah, sure. Um, so one way would be to just go to deploypython.com. Uh, and then that has a link to buy the book on Gumroad. Uh, if you want to go to Gumroad directly, it's uh, gumroad.com forward slash L forward slash Python dash deployments. And I actually created a promo code for anyone who is listening. It's um, a talk Python to me. Uh, with all dashes, we'll make sure that's included as part of the uh, the references. Um, but anyone can use that for fifteen percent off the book. Um, and uh, and also, I'm you know I'm happy to answer questions about it. And um, you know, if people pick it up and they realize like this isn't the book for them, I try to be as clear as possible on the audience. But if if you pick up the book and it's not great for you, I'm happy to give you a refund on it. But um, I just really enjoyed creating the book and hearing from readers and and continuing to improve it along the way. Yeah, that's awesome.
Thanks for writing it. It's a really good book. I, I recommend readers go to deploypython.com, go to the bottom of the page, look at that architecture picture. And if, you know, knowing how all those pieces get created, wired together and set up in a repeatable way is helpful, you know, check out the book. It, it, it's all about that. Cool. Thank you very much, Michael. This has been great. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show, Matt. Talk to you later. This has been another episode of Talk Python to Me. Today's guest was Matthew Mackay, and this episode has been sponsored by Hired and Optbeat. Thank you both for supporting the show. Hired wants to help you find your next big thing. Visit Hired.com slash TalkPython to me to get five or more offers with salary and equity presented right up front and a special listener signing bonus of $4,000. Optbeat is the mission control center for your Python web application. Keep an eye on errors, performance, profiling, and more in your Django and now, starting today, Flask web applications. You can find the links from today's show at talkpython.fm slash episodes slash show slash 26. Be sure to subscribe to the show. Open your favorite podcatcher and search for Python. We should be right at the top. You can also find the iTunes and direct RSS feeds in the footer of the website. Our theme music is Developers, Developers, Developers by Corey Smith, who goes by Smix. You can hear the entire song at talkpython.fm. This is your host, Michael Kennedy. Thanks for listening. Smegs, take us out of here. Stating with my voice, there's no norm that I can feel within. Haven't been sleeping, I've been using lots of rest. I'll pass the mic back to who rocked it best.